Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Ijoma Oyato. And welcome. The President is expected to assent to re-amended Electoral Amendment Bill 2022 tomorrow as civil society groups and main opposition PDP protest delay in signing of the bill into law. President Mohamed Buhari and 22 APC governors confirm March 26, 2022 as date for National Convention of the Party, pass vote of confidence on National Caretaker Convention Committee. Former Minister of Water Resources Sarah Ochekwe and two others found guilty of conspiracy and money laundering as NDLEAs request to detain DCP Abakiari for two weeks is approved by an Abuja court. And at least 60 people are killed in gold mine blast in Burkina Faso. Plus we have international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, Senate confirms nomination of five executive directors for the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. On sports news tonight, Super Falcons coach Randy Waldrum says there will be no room for errors in tomorrow's return leg of the Women Africa Cup of Nations final qualifying match against Cote d'Ivoire in Abidjan. Abuja, House of Representatives begins probe of off-spec petrol imported into the country recently. The President is expected to sign the reworked Electoral Act Amendment Bill into law tomorrow, Wednesday, February the 23rd. Sources close to the President told Channels Television that all is now set for President Muhammadu Buhari to append his signature to the law tomorrow. The President had declined assent to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill in five successive presentations for several reasons. Meanwhile, his special advisor on media and publicity, Femi Adeshino, who was a guest on our breakfast program, Sunrise Daily, also confirmed that the president will sign the reworked Electoral Act Amendment Bill in a matter of hours. You heard Mr. Femi Falano there, a senior advocate of Nigeria, saying that the ruling party has no intention of signing this, of, of asking the president to sign this, or it's not to the advantage uh, well, that this is signed. Mr. Falano You've had new a, controversies <laughs> Mr. around... Mr. Falano is a senior friend, but he'll be surprised this time. He'll be surprised. In a matter of hours, he'll be surprised. In a matter of hours? Yes, not days. Hours could be 24 hours, it could be 48 hours, but not days, not weeks. Do you also know that order is better than speed? You can be in such a rush that you model things up. But when you do things systematically, methodically, orderly, the chances of making mistakes and committing errors are reduced. Meanwhile, the People's Democratic Party has described the delay in assenting to the bill as a ploy by the ruling APC to manipulate the 2023 general elections. At a news conference in Abuja, the PDP National Publicity Secretary says the ruling party is scared of going into the elections with a new law that supports electoral transmission of results. The PDP is also calling on the international community and civil rights organizations to mount pressure on President Buhari to sign the bill. As you are aware, President Buhari continues against the will of Nigerians to withhold assent to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill retransmitted to him since Monday, January 21st, 2022, clear 22 days ago. The refusal to sign the Electoral Act Amendment Bill is nothing short of a premeditated 
and contrived political abortion of the will of the Nigerian people as represented by the elected 109 senators and 360 members of the House of Representatives who unanimously passed the amendment bill in the first instance. The APC is in a mortal fear of electronic transmission of result because it cannot survive the inevitable crushing verdict of the ballot box in the 2023 general elections. This ostensibly informed the conspiracy by the APC leadership of the National Assembly to inject the controversy of the mode of primaries by political parties as a camouflage to scuttle the entire Electoral Act amendment bill in the first place. And in spite of indications of the president's readiness to assent to the bill, civil society organizations under the umbrella of the Situation Room, as well as concerned Nigerians, today gathered at the Unity Fountain in Abuja for a protest to compel the president to sign the bill into law. Citizens have been waiting on the president's assent to the electoral bill after it was retransmitted to him in January following concerns he raised on the initial amendment. A coalition of civil society organizations staging a protest to express their displeasure over the delay to the assent to the electoral amendment bill by President Muhammad Buhari. According to the 1999 amended constitution, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC by law, is mandated to give one year notice of elections. They are therefore concerned that if the president fails to sign the bill today, February the 22nd, 2022, INEC may have to postpone the election. The reason why this action is conducted on this day is because of the expediency um, that is required on the part of, of the president to assent to the bill by 22nd of February. It has implications for the date of elections, and we didn't want a situation where there will be uncertainty as to the dates of the elections. If the president does not assent to the bill today, we would have to move the date of the election. And, and that's the point that civil society and citizens have made. While noting that the National Assembly has the power to override the president, the group is not optimistic that the National Assembly is prepared to follow that path. Is the current National Assembly has the capacity because of what they have done. Because the president has turned down this to veto the president is their constitutional powers. But we don't know if this is where we're going, you know, but uh, they have the opportunity. But the president still has the opportunity to right the wrong. The legislation is considered pivotal to improving the nation's democracy due to some provisions in the bill. However, the groups have their fares. Failure to do this within this time framework will draw us back to the era of analog, to the era of perpetual rigging, to the era of electoral violence, to the era of electoral manipulation. Nevertheless, according to sources close to the presidency, President Muhammad Buhari may in fact assent to the all-important legislation within the next couple of hours, bringing perhaps to an end all speculations about his intentions in the matter. It's now official. The National Convention of the All Progressives Congress will take place on March the 26th, 2022. And this comes as the Progressive Governors Forum has declared that it stands united and has embraced the new convention date as released by the party. The chairman of the Progressive Governors Forum, Governor Atiku Bagudu of Kebi State, who led members of the forum to the State House, stated this after their meeting with the president. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Umezoke, reports. Less than 24 hours after the ruling All Progressives Congress announced the new date for the National Convention, President Muhammad Buhari chairs a meeting with the Progressives Governors Forum at the Council Chamber. He is joined by the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibaju. In the midst of what many have described as a division within the APC ahead of the March 26 National Convention, the meeting seeks to align perspectives, advance an equitable front, and correct gray areas. Our governors divided, not at all. The 22 governors of the APC are united. We are in total support of Mr. President. We are appreciative of his leadership. We commend him for his leadership. We are appreciative of the sacrifice of the national caretaker 
and extraordinary. Meanwhile, the governor of Kaduna State, Nasser El Rafai, has been giving insight into the disagreement among the governors in the APC. The governor admits that there was indeed division, but was simply a matter of timing for the national convention alone, not based on personal interests. During a question and answer session at the State House briefing, the governor also affirmed that the forum has reached an agreement on the zoning of party offices. We were divided. We were divided over the timing of the convention. Okay? There were some governors that felt that we should not have the convention until we resolved all the Congress's issues in some states. As you know, in some states, these matters are even in court. So some governors held the view that we should wait until all these are resolved. And this it's not born out of any agenda or selfishness. It is just a realistic proposition to avoid us um, violating any laws or putting our party structures or elected candidates in danger. So yes, there was differences in opinion about timing. Some of us are saying the Constitution allows us to have convention even if three or four states have issues that are unresolved okay while others are saying no let us finish all the reconciliations and we do this convention after all there is no time limit for the convention as long as we do it before the time for the primaries so that was the difference this is what the media called divided governors in a democratic setting, there is no way you can have 22 governors plus uh, the deputy governor of a number of states. We are 23 now, agreeing on every issue. Today, we are all on the same page. We have agreed a zoning formula for all the six geopolitical zones, and essentially, we swapped northern zones, will take positions that Southern Dons had in the last eight years, and vice versa. It's a very simple, equitable, and fair formula. We will now go back and consult at the zonal level and look at the positions that are available, and the process of the convention preparation will start in earnest. So by the grace of God, on the 26th of March, we would have done our national convention. Whether we'll do the zonal convention before that or do it at the same time, Again, the Constitution is silent, so as our chairman said, we can decide either way. Away from plans for the APC National Convention, the National Assembly has fixed dates for federal lawmakers to vote on clauses for amendment in this phase of the constitutional review. Federal lawmakers in the Senate and House of Representatives are to vote on the amendments on March the 1st and 2nd. The Deputy Senate President, Ovi Omoagege, who announced this during today's plenary, says the Committee on Constitution Amendment will lay the report of the 1999 Constitution Review before the Senate on Wednesday, February the 23rd. In part two, after the break, former governor of Kano State, Rabio Kwankwaso, leads other key players to launch a new political group called national movement that's in a moment do join us again
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. The president is expected to assent to re-amended electoral amendment bill 2022 tomorrow as civil society groups and main opposition PDP protest delay in signing of the bill into law. President Muhammadu Buhari and 22 APC governors confirm March 26, 2022 as date for National Convention of the Party, pass vote of confidence on National Caretaker Convention Committee. Former Minister of Water Resources Sarah Ochekwe and two others found guilty of conspiracy and money laundering as NDLEA's request to detain DCP Abba Kiari for two weeks is approved by an Abuja court. And at least 60 people are killed in a gold mine blast in Burkina Faso. of Congress to take place on March the 26, 2022, and the chairman of the Progressive Governors Forum, Governor Atiku Bagudu of Kebi State, led members of the forum to the State House, and they stated this after their meeting with the President. Less than 24 hours after the ruling All Progressives Congress announced the new date for the National Convention, President Muhammad Buhari chairs a meeting with the Progressives Governors Forum at the Council Chamber. He is joined by the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibaju. In the midst of what many have described as a division within the APC ahead of the March 26 National Convention, the meeting seeks to align perspectives, advance an equitable front, and correct grey areas. Our governors divided, not at all. The 22 governors of the APC are united. We are in total support of Mr. President. We are appreciative of his leadership. We commend him for his leadership. We are appreciative of the sacrifice of the National Caretaker and Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee, and we, are, uh, we, we thank them for the successes recorded uh, under, under them. Our party, like I said, is greater and stronger with more members by the day. The governors also elected to consider the president's stance on a consensus candidate for the party's chairmanship. It reminded us of that we have produced a number of national chairmen by consensus. Baba Kandi emerged as uh, the pioneer chairman of the party by consensus. Uh, as His Excellency John Oyegun emerged by consensus. His Excellency Adams Oshimole uh, emerged by consensus. So he is a believer in consensus as one of the options of producing leadership and he urged us to explore consensus so that we can generate list not while recognizing that many people who have indicated interest are equally competent but knowing that just one person will occupy the office uh, consensus is part of our constitution and he urged us to uh, work towards consensus he also lays to rest views that some members want a further shift in the March 26 date for the National Convention. Today the governors informed Mr. President that uh, we have had the briefing from the caretaker committee and we are supportive of their position. The body language of the governors cannot be described or interpreted in any other way other than unanimous. As a matter of fact, the Plateau State Governor Simon Lalong insists that the governors are not papering over the cracks, but there is indeed an enduring sense of stability within the party even after the president leaves office. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. 
Nigeria first before politics. And that's the promise the national movement is giving Nigerians, and they believe they can deliver on this promise in the next democratic dispensation. At the launch of the national movement in Abuja, the convener of the movement, former governor of Kano State, Rabio Konkwaso, says leaders must look beyond the boundaries imposed on them by political parties. He says the movement became necessary to protect Nigeria from threats of disintegration. Save democracy, rescue the nation. That's the slogan for the national movement, a movement convened by Mr. Rabi Ukonkoso, Nigeria's former Minister of Defense, a former Governor of Kano State, and former Senator. A man whose speakers at this event say is the best choice for president come 2023. <laughs> I say, who should be the president 2023? Dr. Rabiu Musa. Dr. Rabiu Musa. Dr. Rabiu Musa. They premised their call on the need for the national movement on the failings of government over the years, precisely what they describe as its inability to deliver the dividends of democracy to the Nigerian people. As a Christian, while I was campaigning in Kasina and Zampara and Sokoto, where the common people were donating money and helping me, they were even foiling my car. I never promised them that bandits were going to take over their land. I must apologize. Amid cultural displays and more calls for Ikwankoso presidency from representatives of Nigeria's geopolitical zones, Mr. Rabi Ikwankoso speaks on patriotic leadership, urging politicians to put Nigeria first before politics. In our view, everybody matters. And given the current nature of the political environment, in this country, we must look beyond the boundaries imposed on us by the political parties operating in the country today. Launching the national movement on the date 22-0-22-0-22 is significant to these loyalists. The day being a palindrome was consciously chosen, and they say to stand as a historic day marking their collective resolve to redefine Nigeria. The investigative panel constituted by the Zamfara State Chief Judge, Justice Kulu Aliu, has concluded its sitting after giving the Deputy Governor Mahadi Aliu Kuso a 48-hour ultimatum to appear before it to respond to the allegations leveled against him. The seven-member investigative panel has given members of the public the assurance that it will be fair and just to all the parties involved. A member of the probe panel and senior advocate of Nigeria, Abdul Ibrahim, who addressed journalists on behalf of the chairman, said the panel has given all parties the opportunity to present their cases. He adds that the panel will critically look at the testimonies and documentary evidence before proceeding with any action. The Zamfara State House of Assembly is accusing the deputy governor of misappropriation of funds, gross misconduct, abuse of office, among other things, and the seven-man panel has been set up to investigate these allegations. In legal matters, the Federal High Court Just Division has sentenced former Minister of Water Resources, Mrs. Sarah Ochekbe, and two others to three years imprisonment each for money laundering with an option of one million naira fine on each count. Delivering judgment today, Justice Haruna Kuria found the trio of Sarah Ochekbe, Raymond Dabo, and Leo Sunday guilty on two counts out of the three charges filed by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The accused have been standing trial for the past four years on charges bordering on money laundering, conspiracy, and accepting cash payments against the threshold allowed by law. The court found them guilty on counts one and two for conspiracy, as well as retention of 400 million naira, which is above the amount allowed by law. They were, however, discharged and acquitted on the third charge. 
The trio have been released after payment of one million naira option of fine. We cross over to Abuja now, and here's Malkwe Ogun Yusuf. Malkwe. Hello, Ijeoma. We continue in the court where the scheduled arraignment of former Imo State Governor Rocha Sokoracha at the Federal High Court here in Abuja on 2.9 billion naira corruption charges has been stalled following his absence. Senator Okoracha was also not represented by a lawyer. However, six other defendants billed to be arraigned alongside him on a 17-count corruption charge were present in court. The counsel to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Mr. Cosmos Ugu, told Justice Iyang Ekwo that effecting service on the former Imo State governor has proved abortive. He explained that the retinue of security operatives surrounding the senator have made it impossible for Senator Korocha to be served in person by court officials. Justice Equo subsequently fixed March the 28th to enable the EFCC serve Senator Korocha with the charge. Justice Saint Zaina Babubakar of the Federal High Court Abuja has granted the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, the NDLEA, permission to further detain the suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police, Abakiari, and six others for 14 more days with effect from today, February the 22nd. The order was given pending the completion of investigation into allegations against them by the NDLEA. Those to be detained along with Mr. Kiari, uh, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Sunday Ubia, Assistant Superintendent of Police, Bawa James, Inspectors Simon Arigiba, John Nuhu, as well as Chibunna Patrick Umebe, and Emeka Afonso's Ezewane. An affidavit in support of the motion ex parte indicated that Abba Kiari's accomplices were arrested on January the 19th at the Enugu International Airport and that they've admitted being drug couriers on the arrival from Addis Ababa. Kiari and the six other suspects are to remain in detention for another 14 days in the first place, while the NDLEA could come up with fresh requests if need be, or have them arraigned before the court. Still ahead on the news at 10, Minister of Finance says federal government is awaiting consensus to sign a $3.387 billion loan for 10 infrastructure projects. To join us again. Introduce. Welcome back to the news at 10. Well, in the National Assembly, the House of Representatives Committee on Petroleum Downstream has commenced interactions with the four companies named by the Nigerian National Petroleum Company, NNPC Limited, over the recent importation of bad petrol into the country. However, the companies have maintained that they are not responsible for the bad fuel and challenged the NNPC to present the result of the test which it conducted on the product. Meanwhile, the House Committee on Customs has given the CBN governor an ultimatum to appear before it over the e-invoicing policy on imports and exports. Our correspondent Terry Ikumi reports. After meeting with the CEO of the NNPC last week, the House Committee on Petroleum Downstream, which is investigating the importation of the off-spec premium motor spirit, meets with the consortiums mentioned by the NNPC as being responsible. MRS Oil and Gas Limited clearly states that it is not involved in the unfortunate incident. Let me state that there is an approved specification of PMS which is imported into Nigeria. That specification is the product which we brought and I think the GMB of NNPC also attested to the fact that the product which we brought on board the MT Bowl Pioneer was tested at load port and it met Nigerian specification. If you are given a contract with their particular specifications, and you decided not to bring up to that standard, then we have every right to charge them. But based on the letter of the contract and the specification given to them, if they comply, they don't have anything. 
Emadep Energy Limited, the lead partner for the four consortiums named by the NNPC, explains that the company was not responsible for the importation and points at Britannia U, which also denies the claim, explaining that the supplier gave samples which were approved by the NNPC. Some of the consortium members, Emadep, I, McKeefe, immediately engage reputable international partners for delivery of the gasoline products and prompt loading of crude. But uh, one of our sister company, which is the fourth member, Britain, and you choose to engage a different entity and decide to go on our own. You said that we brought in a, a, a hospital. Did anybody, because you, before you said that we brought in, and you will test, there will be a joint test. Was there any joint test between us, NMPC, or whoever? There was not. You, they did an independent uh, um, inspection, which legally, under the Nigerian law, is uh, DPR that is supposed to do the um, testing. Now, you have done the test. What is the test result? We don't have the test result as we speak today. According to her, imported fuel is not normally tested for methanol. In the meantime, the House Committee on Customs is furious with the CBN governor for failing to honor its invitation, and an initial ruling for a warrant of arrest is rescinded, giving the CBN governor another opportunity to appear before the committee. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Well, we're still in the House of Representatives. This time, the lawmakers are asking the federal government to adhere to the clauses and provisions in its agreement with the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU. This, according to the House, will be in the interest of the education sector and the students. The resolution of the House is sequel to a motion on the need to address the frequent strikes by ASU. The House has mandated its committees on labor, employment and productivity, and tertiary institutions to interface with the relevant ministries to address the situation. Meanwhile, another round of negotiations between the federal government and ASU has resumed with a view to resolving the issues that led to the industrial action declared by the lecturers last week. At the reopening of negotiations with the striking lecturers in Abuja, the Minister of Labor and Employment said the government was shocked that the union declared their action despite efforts to address the situation. But the president of ASU, Professor Emmanuel Osodeke, maintained that the government has continued to ignore their demands even after agreements were reached in previous meetings. He also notes that the union is open to discussions and ready to call off the strike once the issues are resolved. And that's all from Abuja. It's back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Makwe. As part of the nation's infrastructure development plan, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning says the country is currently awaiting consensus for it to sign a $3.387 billion loan agreement to execute 10 projects across the country. She explains that the present administration has successfully implemented a range of infrastructure programs that have had a positive impact on the lives of citizens. The minister was speaking at a town hall on the federal government's achievements in infrastructure development organized by the Ministry of Information and Culture. After visiting other parts of the country to showcase the federal government's intervention in infrastructure, the train finally stops in the nation's capital. We have it all the Four key members of the Federal Executive Council are attending this town hall on state of infrastructure in the country. Nigeria's economy and population remains the largest... In her presentation, the Minister of Finance lists the infrastructure projects by the present administration with 1.4 trillion naira to be spent in 2022 for infrastructure and 2.1 trillion naira on human capital development. I would like to use this forum to reiterate that good quality infrastructure is important not only to ensure accelerated and economic growth, but also to ensure enhanced inclusive growth for all within the national space. Subsequently, this administration continues to prioritize spending on human in, on infrastructure as well as you know, on human capital. Next is the Minister of Works and Housing, who speaks about the ongoing projects under his ministry, explaining that the ministry is currently managing over 1,000 road contracts and several housing projects. Our promise of change as a party and as a government is beginning to manifest in the area 
of road transport infrastructure. And it is not what we say, but what the people who we serve are saying about the impact of road and transport infrastructure in their lives. The conversation then moves to the power sector with special focus on the mass metering program and electricity supply. The president has given the order for us to install meters, 6 million meters, before the end of this year. We have installed so far, phase one of it has installed 2.5 million meters. The second phase is about to commence and we'll do that shortly. You will agree with me that nobody comes to your house and drops bills anywhere again. You buy um, cards, like you buy your phone cards for your, for your telephone. If it finishes, the light goes off, so you go pay. It's an improvement from where we were before. While the federal government prides itself in these achievements, the officials here believe the efforts made so far are impacting on small businesses across the country. To some company news now, the Nigeria Breweries PLC has rewarded its distributors and transporters for the year 2021. The event, which held at the Transcor Hilton Abuja, had in attendance top management staff of the company, 140 distributors, 20 transporters, as well as their families and friends. The event was organized to reward customers who have continued to deliver value to the company over the years. It's a nine to reward courage and hard work as officials of Nigerian Breweries PLC, distributors and transporters of the company, converge on Abuja to celebrate the 2022 Distributors Award. The company is saluting distributors and transporters for the various roles they play to keep the brand in business for 75 years. Tonight, it's about celebration, recognizing the great partners we have. Give yourself a great round of applause and please have some fun tonight. A cake to celebrate the occasion is cut. Thereafter, the main reason for the day, as the master of ceremony announces the awards for the distributors. One after the other, the winners step forward for their prizes. From 3 million Naira cash prize for distributors who sold at least 3 million cases of products in 2021 to 6 million Naira cash prize for those who sold at least 6 million cases. An outstanding integrity award is also presented to a customer who met her financial obligations to the company without giving any excuses. Then the biggest award of the day is when three distributors get one IVM truck each under the National Volume Awards category. For 75 years, they have been amazing people doing a fantastic job, the best that this country can afford. They have shown dedication in spite of all the compelling problems of COVID and without this time to recognize them. For the awardees, the recognition is an inspiration to do more. I feel so happy. I feel so excited um, that Nigerian will really recognize the, not just me, but all the winners today. The management of Nigerian Breweries PLC wants the awards to spur more sales and an expanded customer base for the company in the years ahead. Let's look at some more business news. Here's Anne Wilder. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Joma. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Senate has confirmed five executive director nominees for the country's oil sector regulator, and that's the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. Their confirmation follows the consideration and adoption of a report by the Committee on Downstream Petroleum Sector at plenary today. And it comes barely three weeks after a formal request by President Muhammadu Buhari. 
According to a statement released today by the Senate, the nominees confirmed for the NMDPRA include Francis Ogari, Dr. Mustafa Lamorde, and Mansuru Kuliya. Others are Bashir Sadiq and Dr. Zainab Gobi. Meanwhile, the chairman of the Downstream Petroleum Sector Committee of the Senate, Senator Sabo Mohammed, says that their knowledge and experience will be of great benefit to the sector and in particular the country's oil industry. And talking about oil prices traded higher today following an escalation of tensions between Russia and Ukraine. But that's after Moscow ordered trips into two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine. International oil price benchmark Brent crude rose by 1.76% to $96.39 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude surged 1.36% to $92.27 a barrel. Crude prices have increased over 20% this year, more than 80% since the beginning of last year. And these gains have been attributed to other factors as tight supply. And let's head to the Nigerian stock market where it closed moderately positive today after a mixture of profit taking and profit taken by investors. Laya Degoke has the details for us. Thanks a lot for joining us for the stock market report. An additional 7 billion naira is added to the total value of listed equities as the Nigeria stock market trods to positive territory for a second day in the week. That's a mild 0.03% increase that was recorded on the benchmark indicator of equities performance at the close of today's trading session. And this comes amid a mixed sentiment on the sectoral chat. However, the gains that we see today on the NGX came largely from mid-cap stocks across the five key counters of listed equities, but was mainly supported by UBA's share price, which gained 1.16%. Meanwhile, sentiments on the activity charts closed closed positive across board as total volume of shares traded today rose by 0.10%. Value climbed by 23.22%, while number of deals was higher by 0.54%, and that's when compared to Monday's session. The local boss has managed to sustain the uptrend for a third straight day, but traders say they still expect sentiments to improve as the market awaits more full-year earnings results for 2021 to whet investors' appetite. Well, that's it on the Stock Markets Report. I'm Layo Adegoki. Thanks a lot, Layo. Let's now find out how other major markets around the world fared at the close of business. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. It's back to you, Ijoma. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Anne. At least 60 people have died following explosions near a gold mining site in southwestern Burkina Faso. The explosions are believed to have begun and been caused by chemicals used to treat gold stocked at the site. Simon Pusey has more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered troops into two rebel-held regions in eastern Ukraine after recognizing them as independent states. Footage released overnight appeared to show Russian military vehicles heading towards the Ukraine border. Russia said the troops would act as peacekeeping forces in the breakaway regions, but the U.S. described this as nonsense. 
Ukraine's president said his country was not afraid of anything or anyone. Speaking alongside his Estonian counterpart, Zelensky said he was weighing a request from his foreign ministry to break off all ties with Russia. Meanwhile, the German Chancellor has stopped the progression of the controversial Nord Stream 2 pipeline following Moscow's actions in eastern Ukraine. Ich habe das Bundeswirtschaftsministerium heute gebeten, Olaf Scholz announced a halt to the certification of the pipeline from Russia while speaking alongside Irish Prime Minister Michael Martin in Berlin. The pipeline, which would have increased European reliance on energy from Russia, has been a source of contention in Europe and the United States for years. Putin is establishing the pretext for a full-scale offensive. The UK Prime Minister announced sanctions against five banks and three individuals, calling the move just the first step in action that would be expanded if Russia continues its push into Ukraine. This is the first tranche, the first barrage of what we are prepared to do. And we hold further sanctions at readiness to be deployed alongside the United States and the European Union if the situation escalates still further. Meanwhile, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations said America would also be imposing tough sanctions on Russia. We can, will, and must stand united in our calls for Russia to withdraw its forces, return to the diplomatic table, and work toward peace. Local officials say about 60 people have died after an explosion at a makeshift gold mine in a village in southwest Burkina Faso. The blast happened in a market at the gold mining site when dynamite stored there caught fire. Pony's high commissioner told state television that the cause of the explosion was not yet known. Dozens of injured people have been evacuated to the nearest hospital. An investigation has been opened while one person has been arrested and is being held for questioning. The Zimbabwean government has welcomed the decision of the European Union to lift travel and financial sanctions imposed on its vice president and former first lady Grace Mugabe. The EU took the decision despite acknowledging that Zimbabwe's human rights record had not improved and could worsen. The sanctions were first imposed on four people 20 years ago, but were suspended two years ago. They have now been completely removed. Sanctions against Zimbabwe's defence industry remain in place. Queen Elizabeth will miss a planned virtual engagement today because she is still experiencing symptoms after testing positive for COVID-19. I'm here. The palace announced that the Queen had tested positive on Sunday, but was expected to carry on with light engagements, an indication that the world's current oldest and longest reigning monarch was not seriously unwell. She will now decide nearer to the time whether to press ahead with further engagements this week. News of the positive test has sharpened concerns about the health of the monarch two weeks after she marked 70 years on the British throne. The Italian Coast Guard has rescued 573 migrants at sea who are trying to reach Europe aboard two fishing boats in distress in bad weather. The rescue operation took place off the southern Italian coast. Three Coast Guard units transferred the migrants to another vessel, which will bring them ashore at the port of Augusta in Sicily. One body was found on board. Migrants told the Coast Guard the body found was that of a migrant who had died several days earlier. The group of rescued migrants included 59 miners, many of them unaccompanied. And finally, the world's largest Jurassic pterosaur, a 170 million year old winged reptile, has been found in Scotland. Its sharp toothed jaw was spotted in a layer of ancient limestone on Skye's coast. That initial discovery in 2017 has now been followed up with detailed examination of the fossil skeleton, which shows the flying lizard had an eight foot wingspan. It has now been given the Gaelic name Jark Skianch, which translates as winged reptile. The research shows that these remarkable flying reptiles got big tens of millions of years earlier than previously known. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thanks a lot, Simon. Let's take a look at some sports. Here's Victor Matthias. <laughs> Thank you, Jama, and welcome to Sports News. Nigeria's the Tigress have moved up to 14th in the latest FIBA World Rankings. The Tigress are up one spot with 
four points on the strength of two victories and one loss at the FIBA World Cup qualifying tournament in Belgrade earlier this month. They lost their opening game to China but bounced back from a 20-point deficit to beat France and Mali in a rematch of last year's Afro Basket final. The USA remains the number one ranked team in women's basketball with Spain, Australia, Canada and Belgium completing the top five. A Super Falcons coach, Randy Waldrum, says there will be no room for errors when the nine-time African champions face the Lady Elephants of Cote d'Ivoire in the 2022 Women Africa Cup of Nations final qualifying match in Abidjan. Nigeria enjoys a 2-0 advantage in Abuja with both goals coming off the boots of U.S.-based forward Ifoma Onumonu. Meanwhile, the Confederation of African Football has selected Nigerian official Zuera Sule as the center referee for tomorrow's game. The winner of the clash on aggregate will book one of the tickets for the championship holding in Morocco from July the 2nd through the 23rd. And in the UEFA Champions League, reigning champions Chelsea edged Lille 2-0 in the first leg of their round of 16 clash at Stamford Bridge. Kai Havertz got the opener within eight minutes of the first half. Christian Pulisic makes a late charge in from the left, latch onto Ungolo Kante's cute pass and lift a shot beyond Lille goalkeeper Leo Jardim. In the other game, Juventus and Villarreal played a one-all draw in Spain. And Manchester United coach Ralph Ragnick says his side are ready for an emotional battle in their Champions League last 16 first leg at Atletico Madrid tomorrow night, heaping praise on the host manager Diego Simeone for instilling such passion. While Atletico have reached the knockout rounds for the eighth time in the last nine seasons, United are in the last 16 for the first time since 2018-2019 season. Small side, and this also reflects uh, the uh, the character of the of the of the manager. Uh, Diego Simeone is probably one of the most emotional managers uh, in Europe, and um, the, the style and the the way that his teams have have always performed reflects this this those emotions uh, that he always tries to bring into the team. And this is what it's all about. We need to match the level of emotions and of energy in both games. Um, yeah, and this is what we will have to be aware of, and uh, I will try to prepare our team, my team, exactly for that kind of challenge. And to the racetracks, two-time Formula One champion Fernando Alonso is heading into the season in optimistic mood, with the Spaniard hoping the new 2022 rules can deliver enough of a shake-up to make his Alpine team competitive. The 40-year-old returned to the sport last year, signing for the same outfit, he won his two titles in 2005 and 2006 when they ran as Renault. And that's a wrap on Sports News. It's back to Ijama with the wrap of the news at 10. Thanks a lot, Victor. And the main news again. Indications emerge today that President Muhammadu Buhari will tomorrow assent to the re-amended Electoral Amendment Bill 2022. This came as civil society groups and the main opposition, PDP, kicked against the delay in the signing of the bill into law. And also today, President Muhammadu Buhari and 22 APC governors confirmed March the 26, 2022 as date for the National Convention of the Party, just as the governors passed a vote of confidence on the National Caretaker Convention Committee. That's the news for 10 tonight. Thanks a lot for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Bonyato. Have a good night.